once you reach like the pro leagues and like the one percent it becomes bigger than you you can't just play the game for yourself like you know you got people looking looking at you back home you got a whole city on your back you got your family your friends like you know depending on you and you know looking up to you and random kids that you never seen looking up to you so um to going back to what you said like um I didn't have that much support for my for my city at first and for my people. So I could have been like I could have went on that path of like, you know, I made it by myself, you know, I did all this stuff by myself. But but that's false, you know, like my, my pops and my moms, like, you know, they, they believed in me first before I even believed in myself. I used to watch those camps all the time on YouTube and these college highlights and like, damn, I wish I could do this and and I never did anything. I never did any action. And my mom saw the potential. She was like, Let's go do this this summer, let's go to this camp and do this. So I give credit to my mom, my pops. I give credit to my brother for like supporting me on that stuff. And you know, people keep keep saying, yeah, I'm a self-made this, self-made that and all that stuff. But you look back at their journey, there's somebody that hold them down, you know what I'm saying, that supporting them when they had nothing and you know, nobody believed in their vision. So yeah, like I say, no such thing as a self-made millionaire. What's going on, y'all? This is Mo, your host of the Trap and Die podcast, and I'm just here to tell you, man, why you're here. If you're new, make sure you hit that like button. Make sure you hit that subscribe button. You know, uh, make sure you follow us, man, as we continue to push out this content and uh, create some things for the Washington Commanders and the NFL, man. But but mainly the Commanders. This is a Washington channel. Uh, I, I want everybody to be involved. I want everybody to catch these live streams uh, weekly. I want everybody to be a part of this this growth that we got going on over here, man. So if you're here, if you're new, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you stay tuned, man, for much more content, fire content, uh, and and as we keep things pushing, man. So yeah, get to it. We appreciate it. All that good stuff. Peace. <laughs> uh, joining us right now is Washington Commanders corner Benjamin St. Juice, uh, the big dog Ben. I appreciate you joining us, man. How you feeling? I'm feeling good, man. I appreciate the opportunity. Good, man. We, we appreciate the opportunity <laughs> hey it's always good to be here chatting you know? it's always good to be on a podcast chat especially with aj y'all so i appreciate that already um before we get to, to some of the questions we had it was a conversation that aj got going i want to get your opinion on this ben um so aj had mentioned you said you don't, you don't see it right now with Traylon and uh Traylon burks out of arkansas and there was some conversation about drake london too given that he's six four and Traylon, i think uh what is he he about six six three six four two right aj he's yeah, up there in so. height. yeah my thing is i think there's a stigma with the the, the bigger the bigger receivers in in that now i haven't seen Traylon. i've seen drake i haven't seen Traylon. but there's a big like a stigma in, in that the bigger guys are more so the the stiffer ones and they only win with their strength like that's that's the only way they win and they they can jump high and, and, and snatch a ball in a contested catch situations i don't know i mean of course sometimes it turns out to be true but I, I feel like the first reason to cause doubt or have doubt is for them to say i don't know because i don't i don't think they have and, and that's kind of the reason what that people tend to rely upon is the the size the the lack of mobility or lack of uh, athleticism and stuff like that I, that's where i'm at aj i don't know what trey line is but i just feel like that's the that's the case because people say the same thing with uh with drake london that like, he don't separate that's not true he separates he just he doesn't have the foot speed down the field that's all it is i mean i, I guess we could ask ben you know ben's a, a big physical corner who would you rather face the the smaller shifty guy or the guys that's comparable as far as like weight and height as you um on the field i think it um it depends on where they're at on the field. Like for me, since I'm a bigger guy, if I have a bigger receiver, let's say, I don't know, uh, the guy from USC that you guys were talking about, that's a little bit more on my, uh, on, like, I have a little bit better advantage, like on the outside, since I'm quicker. I might not be the fastest, but since like with my quickness and my agility, I can make up for like, you know what I'm saying? The lack of maybe top speed. And I, I that gives me the advantage. That gives me the head over a bigger receiver. Now you put, Let's say you got a guy like I don't know, like Tyreek Hill, Hunt Renfro from the Raiders in the slot, where you got a lot, a lot more space, a lot more motion. This is where you know the guys create a lot of separation. It's really hard, like you know, what I'm saying, like for me, like for other corners, I'm trying to put their hands on them because on the outside, you know, it's one on one. You up in the face, you can use your quickness, your hands, and you can make up a lot of speed. But on in the, on the inside, we have a lot more space, and it can motion them in and out and get in bunches and stack to create some more space. This is where things get hard. 
So, so to go back to answer the question like the easiest way possible, you got a bigger receiver, you keep him on the outside. You know what I'm saying, and you got a corner that's quick and big. He's gonna win that matchup. But if you put that guy on the inside and you give him a little bit more space, then he can make up a lot of that ground. So, what do you prefer, just in general? You mentioned your athleticism to a degree, your agility, your quickness. But and when it when it comes to just your general, uh, your stable, what your skill set, do you prefer the physical nature of being a corner, uh, like the men- the mental side of being a corner, or or the athletic? Obviously, all three are important components. But but what is the one that you rely on in terms of your game on a, on a down and down out basis? Uh, I would say the NFL. Um... Mental game is the biggest thing. A lot of people always ask me, like, what's the biggest step between college and NFL? Like, how did you adjust and all that stuff? Like, it wasn't that that much more physical than college. It wasn't that faster. It's just the guys, you know what I'm saying? Like, their toolbox, they have a lot of tools in it. And the guys are really, really, really smart. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you don't do your, your technique right for one play, they're going to exploit that. And then the next play, they're going to change their technique and all that stuff. So it's always a chess game when you get you get in the NFL because guys been there 5, 10, some guys 15 years. So they mastered, you know, all those little techniques, those little tips and tricks that they can use. Uh, but I definitely say the mental game is the biggest thing I'm trying to sharpen. I'm always trying to, like, get better at that. And I think my uh, physicality, like you said, like when you think of a corner, you're like, ah, he's good, he's fast, he's quick, he can cover, but can he tackle, can he show up in the run game? And I think that's something that I have that I'm not scared of, you know, put my nose in there and fit the A, B or D gap. And um, that gives me versatility. That means now you can put me on the inside, I can put me a nickel, I can blitz, you know, I can, you know, play around the box and all that stuff, like, you know, things that I'll probably be doing this season. I was gonna. Uh, I was gonna ask you, Ben. Uh, well, matter of fact, I'll, I'll let Dre ask you. Yeah, I was just gonna go, uh, Ben. Uh, you know, the team had high hopes for you last year out of the draft, and you look. Yeah, you showed a lot of promise in training camp last year, but the season didn't end too well with the injury and all. How's your confidence level? Where are you at right now mentally? And what's the team's vision for you going forward? Like, will you have an opportunity to compete for starting corner on the outside this year? Yeah, there's, uh, I mean, when I was leaving, uh, when we left um, after the last game against the Giants and we had exit meeting, you know, there's nothing that changed with my plan. You know, I showed what I needed to show. They seen what they needed to see. And like you said, it's unfortunate uh, with injuries. That's part of the game. So the plan didn't change for 2022. Like I'm right back, right back in the mix, you know, fighting for that, you know, so for more playing time, even being with the starters first string. And um, I'm going to have more responsibility. And now that I'm, you know, I've been fully healthy this whole off season. You know, it's right, right back to work. So it took some time because you know it's serious injury. It's not like you know pull a hamstring and knee or whatever. You know, it's your head. You need it after football. So I had to take my time with it. But the plan didn't change. So it's the same thing. Yeah. So I was going to ask you, Ben. You know, being one of the very few Canadian players in the NFL, explain to the people a little bit about your journey. You know, coming from Montreal. Uh, to the States, to playing college ball and, and now being in the NFL? Oof. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> when I got to explain, it's so much that goes into it because you know what? Like, um, just to give you a, a stat, like, I got drafted 74th pick in the third round last year. The last guy that got drafted that high was in 1996. So there was nobody else before that from where I'm from that got drafted at all like as high as I went. And there's only three guys to where I'm from in the NFL, you know, that made it. So that's that's how that's how big it is. And that's how like uncommon it is because hockey is really like, first of all, we're a small, like, you know, province, state, small country. And our primary sport is hockey, you know? So when you tell people I want to make it to the NFL, like not only that you don't even have support from your own community and people, but you know what I'm saying? Like, they, we don't have the resources to make it. We don't have no 24-7 camps or rivals or Nike or scholarships and all that stuff. People don't come recruit. Like, scouts don't come recruit Canada. So, personally, I, in 2015, I remember I had to uh, save up, like, half of the money. And then my, my, my pops put the, the other half, and we drove 10 hours to go to a Michigan camp. And this is where I got my first offer because they discovered me there. It was, like, 6'3", about 190, moving great. And that was when Jim Harbaugh was there. He was like, man, that, that kid reminds me of Richard Sherman. So let me give him a scholarship, man. He's going to be something great. And then, you know, so after that, starting the ball rolling. But you really have to make those steps and sacrifice a lot to make it because it's not like I'm from 
I don't know, Georgia or Virginia or whatever, and there's a rival camps and the scouts and, ah, oh, we're going to talk about that. People don't know you. And they doubt you, too, because they want you to come to a camp because they're like, okay, he might be a baller in Canada, but can he compete with the U.S. guys? Come down here to the camp and prove it to us. You know, that's how, that's how they feel about it. I think, and, and this is a good point, too, because there are two things that I, I personally couldn't wait to talk about. Um, and it is actually stemming from, from some, some tweets and, uh, I think it's generally important in terms of a makeup of a person's character. And for you, you had two that, that stood out to me, right? Uh, one thing that you mentioned, you said, uh, ain't no such thing as a self-made millionaire. Give credit to the circle, uh, to your circle of people that su supported you when you had nothing. Um, and, and I think to, to, to what you just mentioned, the, the 10-hour drive to Michigan and, and to that football camp, uh, just, just speak on how important it is for you to have a team that helps support you but also uh, through your journey of being a professional football player and uh, your self-awareness and knowing that you needed the help to get to where you are. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, once you reach like the pro leagues and like the 1%, it becomes bigger than you. You can't just play the game for yourself. Like, you know, you got people looking, looking at you back home. You got a whole city on your back. You got your family, your friends, like, you know, depending on you and, you know, looking up to you and random kids that you never seen looking up to you. So um, to going back to what you said, like, um, I didn't have that much support for my for my city at first and for my people. So I could have been like I could have went on that path of like, you know, I made it by myself, you know, I did all this stuff by myself. But but that's false, you know. Like my, my pops and my moms, like, you know, they, they believed in me first before I even believed in myself. I used to watch those camps all the time on YouTube and these college highlights and like, damn, I wish I could do this and, and I never did anything. I never did any action. And my mom saw the potential. She was like, Let's go do this this summer, let's go to this camp and do this. So I give credit to my mom, my pops. I give credit to my brother for like supporting me on that stuff. And you know, people keep keep saying, "Yeah, I'm a self-made this, self-made that, and all that stuff." But you look back at their journey. There's somebody that hold them down. You know what I'm saying that supporting them when they had nothing, and you know, nobody believed in their vision. So, yeah, like I say, no such thing as a self-made millionaire. So, I mean, I, I I know one of the NFL guys that you look up to, uh, being you know former Raider. Uh, cornerback Namdi Asamuda, but why why did he gravitate to you so much? Like what what in his game personality that gravitated to you so much? You know, all the way in Montreal. Yeah, I mean there was there's two main guys. I think Namdi overall is like my role model on and off the field. Richard Sherman definitely opened the door. Uh, and gave me like you know motivation to be a corner when everybody was five ten, five eleven, and shorter and quicker. Richard Sherman came out six three, three hundred, big corner. But definitely Namdi, uh, Namdi was was lethal back in those days. He was really a shutdown corner, very twitchy, you know, similar similar game and all that stuff. But what um, what makes me gravitate to Namdi is that I always been somebody that thinks outside of football. Also, Namdi was an amazing all pro corner, but outside. Of football, he was able to uh, make a great transition to the acting, you know, acting game, and he was able to reinvent himself after football. Being a very, very smart guy, that went to Cal and you know, surround himself by with great people. He now has his foundation. So, so all the great stuff that you want, to, that I want to do after I'm done playing football, Namdi is doing it, and he plays the same position, and we're the same. You know, we have the same physical shape and all that stuff. So, I really gravitate toward Namdi Asmo. That those are the reasons. Wow. And, and and you forgot his wife bad too. Not to get you yeah. in trouble. Carrie hey. Carrie Carry Washington. He, got, he, got Carry Washington. Oh, he, so got, he, he, he went Carrie. He, he, he just lit. made it. Yeah. He made it in life, you know. So that's a, a good person to look <laughs> that up is to. Lit. He made it in life, so. hey. hey, well, Ben, um, I got a question for you. Right now, on that defense, who would you consider one of the guys you look up to, or somebody that may have taken you under their wing so far on the defense, like a leader on that defense? Uh, I would say Kendall Fuller. And what's crazy is that me and Kendall Fuller like don't really like hang out or talk too much, but he knows that I'm always watching him, whatever he's doing. Kendall is a super humble guy, doesn't talk too much, but I know that he's been in the league for a good amount of years and he knows how to prepare and how to be ready for games and practice and all that stuff. So I always watch Kendall. Um, I remember asking him a few times on how he watched, uh, you know, game film to prepare during the week. So I try to learn from him. And I think, any rookie coming in, find a, a good veteran that's been there for a few years and follow him and see that everybody got their little schedule with the details and all that stuff. And, you know, you follow that, you'll be in the league for a long time too. So that's what I try to do. 
Bam, you have been in the DMV for over a year now. Um, so I'd be remiss if I don't ask you this question. Has AJ taken you to a go-go yet? Um, this, this, this is something that I, I feel like it's a, it's a rite of passage in the area. And I, and I feel like if he hasn't taken you, now, he, taking you yet, he's probably let you down. I know well, that is, AJ. Stuff like that, but well, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you down because we ain't going to no damn go go. <laughs> AJ and Virginia do. They ain't going nah. to go go's. <laughs> hey, look, they got a little they got a little spot out. Shout out to shout out to hashtag. You know what I'm saying? Hashtag yeah. is in VA. Take uh-huh. my we, we call we call we call that hash. We don't call it hashtag. We call it hash brown. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, first of all, hey Ben, don't look. Don't if if something happens down the road, fingers crossed it doesn't, and you're here for your your career. Do not do not exit the DMV without going to a go go. Okay, and make sure new impressions is playing. Find out who new impressions. <laughs> well, y'all gotta explain. You gotta Google explain it, what go go is. No, y'all gotta oh, explain what go go is. DC culture. You know, it's DC culture. My bad. It is <laughs> a DC, it's a that, DC that thing, bro. My my bad, man. That's yeah. It's a DC thing, man. It, it originated in the area, uh, and it's it's been here for at least. 40 years, uh, if my math right, something like that. Yeah, just the 80s, 70s, 80s, yeah. Yeah, 70s, 80s. So that's 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 where GoGo came from. Uh, well, what, hold on. What is what, so, Ben? What are you listening to? Play. Tell, tell us what's on your playlist. I feel like I know Drake gonna so, be on there. So what's the GoGo, <laughs> AJ? Like, run me down. What, is, what are they talking about right now? Man, so so GoGo is like they use like the African drum patterns, but mix it up in a higher pace, like chanting music, like kind of like. Kind of like James Brown, but with more African drums, but it's yeah. more hype. Like, okay. I, I'm, I'm gonna send you. I'll send you like yeah. send them coach the Mochella when we get when we get send off them of this. I'll, yeah, right. I'll send you like a video or something. I mean, I've never got into it. Of course, I love music. I love you know what drums. I, I used to play the drums, right but Hold on, that man. was <laughs> never my thing. Like Go Go was never Jamal. My thing. Jamal was in a band. Weren't, weren't you in a band, Jamal? I show show as hell was. Yep. Hold on, man. Let me say. I'm about to send you a junk. <laughs> Hey, it's like black people's rock music, man. That's what it is here. <laughs> yeah, no bullshit. Right. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it, it, it gets it gets better. crazy. I mean, now it's a bit more chill, but yeah, I mean, for me, growing up, I never went to go go. I really don't like go go music. I mean, I'm I embrace it because it's part right of the culture, AJ. but <laughs> yeah. I'm... So this is so Ben. This is the difference between guys from Virginia and guys from like Maryland, PG County, where the stadium is at. <laughs> And everything yeah, like county, me, county. me and Maul are PG County dudes, so you know okay. we, we get to the go go. <laughs> uh huh. All right. Where was I? I'm out there. I'll go ahead and send it to you in a second. But Ben. But yeah, Dre, 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 Dre was asking you, what are you listening to these days? Oh, what am I listening to these days? Um, I mean, obviously, you said Drake. Drake is uh, Drake could put out some trash music, regardless, we're gonna ride with him. Because he's the he's the he's the mayor of he's the prime minister of a of a country. He got probably more power than the damn president. So we're gonna ride with him. We're not going against no no fellow Canadian. But um, no, nah, I'm pretty diverse in like what I what I listen to. Like I know I got a little bit of funk in there, some old school. I like Nas. Nas my favorite rapper. Wu Tang. Um, um, and even got a little Miles Davis in there. Um, you know, oh, you like Eric the old Cuba, school stuff. Eric Cuba do, yeah. Bill Scott, I, know, you know, I, Miles Davis on, I like this. I like this. He's a young dude on. He on the high type of music. You know what I'm saying? And uh, <laughs> shout out to pops. You know, he he put me on. I feel like if you only got one genre of music in your library, you're not really like maximizing your like like your your diversity in terms of music. You don't really know music, and that's like I come my my pops showed me a lot of different type of music, so I appreciate that. Oh, you know, I was hoping for a little uh, young thug in there, but you know what I'm saying. Hey, all the my, all the recents is all in there. I'm just saying, like when I really <laughs> want to listen to music, like and I'm tired of it, like hearing the same thing, yeah. I always go back to the old school stuff. You know what I'm saying? So, I respect that. I respect yeah. that. Um, so back to to the Washington side, man. Um, Coach Harris, Chris Harris, uh, how has he influenced your game? I mean, it's it's been one year, and obviously, uh, one year is it's a lot of time, but. Uh, in mm-hmm. terms of your time spending with him and and obviously learning things on the fly, on the field, and practices, training camp, all those things, how has he influenced your game through his coaching? Well, I think, like, you know, it's very, very hard to learn a lot when you're in the NFL because you reach, like, that, like I said, that 1% where all the knowledge that you have from college, like, 
you kind of learn it from like your teammates. And once you get to the league, you learn from teammates or just playing the games. Not much that a coach can coach, like tell you. But what I can say is that, like I said previously, the mental aspect of the game is the biggest one. So I learned a lot from him. He was a veteran in the NFL, um, played safety. So he has a lot, a lot of knowledge on the game. So I try to, you know, be with him, trying to watch some film, ask him some questions all the time. I never been like, he always said, never be shy to ask a question. And I took that, like, you know, I took that seriously. Like anytime I have a question, like I raise my hand, I go see him. I'm trying to make sure that everything, everything right. You know, there's no, you know how they say, there's no like rocks, like, What's that saying? Like, unturned? Like, you don't leave no rocks oh, no unturned stone, or whatever? No, no stone. No, stone, they go. They go. No stones unturned. You know what I'm saying? I always make sure that I have everything ready for the game because I don't want to be like, damn, I should have asked him that. But very smart guy. Very cool. Um, cool coach to be around. Young. And he's black, you know. We don't have that many, like, black coaches in the NFL. Like, so it's cool to be around him. You know what I'm saying? Like, he treat us like, you know what I'm saying? We're, we're friends. We're like, you know what I'm saying? We're teammates. But at the same time, we're giving them respect as a coach. So, I learned a lot from him, and it's a, always a cool environment to learn, you know. Environment is really key in the NFL where, you know, you don't have a coach that always going to be, like, on your ass and screaming all that stuff, and you're like, man, like, I ain't even trying to learn no more. Like, it's always good vibes. You know? So what, what what have you been up to this offseason? Like, uh, where have you been training? Who have you been training with? I mean, uh, I know all this stuff already, but. <laughs> <laughs> you got to let, let the people know. <laughs> yeah, so uh, when the season ended uh, in, in uh, late January, I went to I went back to where I trained before the, uh, before the combine. So I went to L.A., catch some good weather, you know, get away from the DMV weather. Um, so I, I worked out out there. I had a DB coach out there. So I trained, got some good lifts in, some good DB work. And then I went straight down to Atlanta where I have my uh, position coach, his name is Oliver Davis, you know, Oliver trained guys, like, I mean, I don't know how many first round picks and like all pro DBs he trained, but he's a really, really good guy. So we always got a Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday NFL group where it's like, you know, me, uh, JC Horn, AJ Boye, uh, Andre Sisko, um, Kendall Fielder, um, who else? AJ Terrell and all those guys, you know, from the from the from the Atlanta uh, area, and then we train. And that's another thing that I love about doing this is like, you know, I could stay up there at the facility and just train and be whatever and wait for training camp. But when coming down here, like, it's priceless the knowledge that we can share. You know, those guys are all pro. Some guys are pro bowlers. Some guys are first round. So you can like share knowledge and you know critique the game of somebody else and we watch film and all that stuff like stuff that you know you can't really get anywhere else but here you know because of what oliver like was able to build with his with his connection and his foundation so it's been a great off season so far so i i think that's a, a interesting topic in, in a way that I, I didn't even think about it at first but you were talking about training now obviously working with with your coach and your or, or your trainer and um Obviously, we all know the baseline. Technique is important for any position. Proper technique, proper technique. But I think when you get to the higher level, it's a question that I, I'll probably try to butcher it, but it's hopefully the message comes across. When you have to understand that you're playing against a guy that's, who's in front of you who is uh, one of the upper echelon receivers or um, they, they're really good at X, Y, Z, and you know that your technique is important and you have to trust your technique. And sometimes when, when DBs lose, it's because they do something that they normally don't do or they do something at one time and, and, and they kind of get beat because they did that one thing that they that they normally never do. Um, mm -hmm. I, I guess my, my question to you is, <clears throat> obviously the training is important, but can you speak to the, to the level of how important technique is because of the fact that you know that at the end of the day, if you trust what you're doing, if you trust your training, if you trust everything that you've learned to this point, you're going to be able to be that shutdown corner. You're going to be able to be somebody who can stop some of the better guys in the league because you are sounding your technique, your discipline, and you have that mental area on lockdown because you have the smarts to know what this player is kind of doing or what he wants to do. Yeah, I mean, um, to, to, to short it down, like, technique in the nfl and mental toughness i think especially at db like or actually at defensive back mental toughness and technique is the two main things that you need to really succeed you can run four two jump 40 whatever all those things are not going to help you the only thing they're going to help you with is when you get beat you can catch up to the guy 
But the reason why you get beat is because you ain't got no technique, you're not disciplined. And like you said, like sometimes, like, you know, that mental discipline, it kind of slip up and you're trying to do something else or you don't jam at the line, you just open the game. You're like, damn, man, why I did that? It's because you're getting tired. It's the fourth, it's the third quarter. And you're like, damn, fuck that technique, you know? Like, I'm, I'm tired, I'm going to do something else. But the guys that are really, really good, you know what I'm saying, that I study, like Namdi and you know, Richard Sherman and all those guys, you know what I'm saying? They have the mental testament to stick to the script and stick to their technique and what they know and what they like came in for the game plan. And, you know, that's everything. You know, you sh- I mean, how many guys, how many combine warriors y'all seen, like, you know, go to the NFL and then not even <laughs> play a damn snap of defense? You know, so. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay, a couple more, man. Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, and Jameson Williams, man. I did not know Jameson went to Ohio State during AJ. Um, up until I started reading yeah. Derek's Derek's articles, uh, so he was there I think for two seasons. Uh, Jamison was. Um, so Ben, you had some exposure to to, to whatever degree. I don't know your. That's I mean that's why you're here. You're here to explain it. But you had some exposure to Wilson, Alave, and, and Williams while you were in. Uh, from this. So I, I guess my question to you um, is, what stands out to each of these guys because they are potential prospects for Washington at this point with Carson Wentz landing here. Uh, what mm-hmm. what do you think about these three guys? What are some of the top things that come to your mind when you hear Gary Wilson's name, Chris Olave's name, and, and Jameson Williams? Playmakers. I mean, they're just flat out playmakers. I mean, Chris, Garrett, and the guy from from Bama. Like those those guys just make plays at the X, Y, Z position. You know, whatever you put, wherever you put them, like in the slot or outside, they make plays. They, they do they have contested catches all guys ran low four fours you know and all that stuff so i mean it just it's, it's just an easy weapon to give carson if the you know washington decided to draft him in the first round or whatever or second so um i mean you can't really go wrong with any any of those guys that you just named to be honest because and not that ain't that many like weaknesses to their game like i, I remember watching them in college and having some of my teammates play against them and all that stuff like the boy's good well, Ben, uh, <laughs> let me ask you, since we are coming up on draft season, can you talk a little bit about your pre-draft process? And did you meet with Washington's coaches before the pre-draft? Like, did you kind of have an idea that these guys would draft you, you know, maybe third? You, you, I don't know if you knew what round you may have went, went in, but did you kind of have any idea that Washington might be a team that you might be going to? Absolutely not. Every team change on, on, on draft day, I was supposed to go to uh, – to a team out west in the late second round and um they drafted another corner and then after that washington traded up with the 49ers to uh pick me up before uh, uh a few other teams was about to, to, to pick me right after the 74 pick so it was uh, i think i met with i met once with coach harris during the process and i met with them at the senior bowl but i was it like that was long gone like i completely forgot that wasn't like the team that my agent was telling me like yeah they're going to pick you up and uh when they called like Washington, I'm like, oh, okay, okay, Washington, D.C., okay, because yeah, we still the football team at that time, so I was like, okay, all right, yeah, I almost called him by the old name, you know what I'm saying, I was about to get canceled even before I get on, on at the facility, I was about to call him by the old name, you know, so, uh, but yeah, I had no idea, I was surprised. That's good, man. Um, okay, so before we get out of here, there's there's one more thing, and, I, and I'm glad we can circle back to it, so typically, fellas, y'all know we always do the quote of the week for real. Um, but I, I want Ben to, to take the stab at this one because it, it revolves around his, his second tweet, and, and I love it. Um, now, again, tweets are tweets. I tweet all the time and don't be mean and shit. You know, I could, I could just say whatever at the moment and just feel what I feel and don't even think twice about it. But you said something very short and sweet, very simple. Um, I'm going to bet on me over and over. Uh, I understand it. Like I said, it can be general at times, but did you tweet this from a certain emotion? Um, or, or regardless, just just what does it mean? And, and we'll leave this as the quote of the week for everybody. Uh, that stuff is like spontaneous, to be honest. Like, I probably finished the workout and I was feeling myself. I'm like, man, I can't wait for the season to get out there and really like, because like I said, I only play like half the season and I felt like I was getting better every game. And that's, that's, I ain't gonna lie, that shit sucks. I was at home. I was like, man, I was getting better and better. And, and this stuff got cut short. So I probably 
probably finished a workout, probably finished like watching some film or whatever, and I got hungry and I was like, man, you know, I'm betting on myself. Like I always bet on myself, but like you know, I, I like sometimes, sometimes I like to tweet it out, you know, because there's always someone looking up, like looking at like my profile or whatever, and that's like you know need a little bit more motivation, need to be like, you know what, I'm gonna bet on myself too, you know. If you don't believe in yourself, then who who will? So. Absolutely. Uh, like I said, man, that's important for everybody to understand that. I do. I, it's a it's a mentality thing, and uh, again, you 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 had your you had your feelings when you tweeted it, and that's that's all that matters, uh, fellas. Ben, I appreciate you joining us. First and foremost, before we get out of here, I actually plug talk because I'm I'm not gonna sit here and act like you ain't got nothing going on. You a, you a million dollar man. <laughs> um, but but let the people know what you got going on, where they can hear from you. Um, obviously you you or or read your tweets, obviously, but uh. And, and all that good stuff. Whatever you got going on, let the people know. Whatever I got going on, man. Um, close the line. Close the line. Hey, yeah, you got the you got the original. You know what I'm saying? That's that's my brand. That's my LLC. We we, we got a, a clothing brand around there. We got one of the biggest camp in Canada coming in July for all my Canadians and people mm -hmm. from Montreal looking out. Like we got the biggest camp coming up with a lot of big names coming. So um, be on the lookout for that and. Uh, yeah, keep bending on yourself. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, Chopper Dive, that is what it is. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with the All-32 side. The fellas will be back next Tuesday to, uh, to talk a little bit more Commanders Talk. Ben, appreciate you once again, my man. You stay safe. Enjoy your evening. Hey, appreciate you, bro. Go.